I'll just have to remind me. Timo knows me. If I'm not reminded, I can't remember nothing. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> we're going to continue our teaching on evangelism. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking about what I've been teaching y'all. And, uh, you know, this, this is, has to be more than just a Bible study. I mean, this is really a, an urgent call to the church to come back to evangelism. Because I, I don't know what the, what the history of evangelism is there in Kenya, but the history of evangelism here in the United States is it's almost completely gone. I mean, literally, 51% of the millennials do not know what the Great Commission is. Half of the millennials, half of the age 25 uh, to 37 or something like that, or 22 to 37, the millennial generation, they don't, they don't know. <clears throat> and and I've said this, I'm going to say it again, because this has to be more than a teaching. You know, I've, uh, I've been blessed to see some great moves of God uh, in my lifetime. The Jesus movement, which is where contemporary music came from. Before the Jesus movement, it was just hymns out of a hymn book. But a bunch of hippies and drug addicts got saved during the Jesus movement and wanted to bring that kind of music into the church. And so that's where contemporary Christian music came from. It was birthed because of, of an evangelistic movement in the United States. And, uh, and it, was, it was about, let me tell you, people, these long-haired hippies and drug addicts, they were getting saved by the thousands and thousands, and it was revolutionizing churches because all of a sudden a bunch of long-haired people started coming to these churches, and they really didn't even want them, but they didn't know what to do with them. And, uh, of course, you know, I got to be a part of 16 years of traveling in the United States doing evangelism and saw, you know, well over 120,000 people come to Jesus. We saw churches full of people, auditoriums so full that we had to have closed circuit TV in the gymnasiums just to handle the crowds because so many people were coming. And those kind of moves of God, they weren't birthed because of a financial freedom seminar. They weren't birthed because of how to have a good marriage seminar. These things were birthed out of the heart of evangelism. <laughs> you know, pastor in a church for 14 years where we would baptize 300 people some months. Months. 300 people in a month. Many months. And, and we were seeing people saved every Sunday, every Wednesday night. And that wasn't birthed because I was always teaching about, you know, how to become prosperous, how to be a successful businessman. We were seeing that many people saved because I was preaching evangelism, outreach. And, and my brother's on now, Rob, and he was a part of that. He saw me, man, we'd have 20, 30, 40 people saved on a Sunday morning. But in order to get that many lost people to church, you have to do more than put a sign in front of your church. We would like lost people to come visit. You know, fish don't jump in your boat because you put a sign, all fish welcome. <laughs> if you're going to catch fish, you've got to go get them. you got to go where the fish are. You don't expect the fish to come to you. And, and so great moves of God. I, was a, I got to attend a, a revival in Florida in the United States. It was a revival that lasted over five years in Pensacola, Florida, and they saw hundreds of thousands of people get saved, people from all over the world, the world were flying to Pensacola, Florida, because it was such a mighty move of God. I got to attend that revival three, four, five times. I took a busload of people from our church, 
And every time they would meet, people would, listen, I'm telling you the truth. They would run down the aisle, drop on their knees and slide to give their life to Jesus. That movement was not birthed out of a church growth seminar. <laughs> it was birthed out of evangelism. And so what I'm teaching in this Bible study is really an urgent plea to the church to come back to evangelism. And you know, listen, you don't have to read much of the New Testament to know what it's about. I think you've read enough to know that almost on every page of the New Testament is outreach and evangelism. How have we gotten away from this? And here's the problem. The problem, since the church has backed away from evangelism, churches are dying everywhere. And the only growth that we have in churches is when we swap sheep. We're not having growth from new people being born again. The majority of the growth in most churches is people moving from one church to the other. And the reason why that's happening is because we're not going out to get the sheep. We're not going out to reach people. Well, I don't know, you know, we're doing all these awesome seminars. <laughs> we're doing all these great conferences, but we're not going out and reaching the lost. And you can talk about it, you can study it, you can preach it, you can memorize it, you can mark it in your Bible, but you won't know what I'm talking about till you get out and do it. And, you know, listen, it was the heartbeat of Jesus to seek and to save that which is lost. It was the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul. It was the heartbeat of the New Testament church. And it should be the heartbeat of the church today. But we're a far cry from it. We really are. And I think we, 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 we like to think that we're doing it when we're actually not. <laughs> I mean, really, we kind of pat ourselves on the back like, you know, we're an evangelistic church. Well, here's the way you can tell if you're an evangelistic church. Are you growing? It's just that simple. That's all you got to do. Is your church growing numerically? Not by people that are moving from one church to the other, but are you growing by new converts? So you, you really got to ask yourself, are we a growing church? And if you're not, then that's really an indictment that you're not an evangelistic church. Every evangelistic church will grow. Listen, even if you're not preaching the truth, and you go out there and you reach lost people, they're going to come to your church. Even if you're not preaching the truth. Why? Because evangelistic principles work. They just work. But we have to apply those principles. And, you know, graduating from a Bible school and in, in uh, evangelism or getting a certificate of a degree in evangelism is not doing evangelism. Knowing that we're supposed to do evangelism is not the same as doing evangelism. So, we, you know, it's not about memorizing it and studying it and marking it. <clears throat> and, you know, I asked you last week and I'm going to make sure that it's on uh, on my YouTube channel on this recording. I mean, I challenge you to get a certain color marker that you've not used in your Bible. Read all the way through the New Testament and mark every place in your Bible where outreach and evangelism is suggested or said. <clears throat> you know, I mean, you ought to have enough heart for it to study that for yourself, not to preach. But just as you read through your Bible, have that marker there, and you mark it, mark it, mark it, and then flip back and look at all of those places that are marked. It will be a great source of conviction of what the church ought to be doing today, and it's not doing. And, you know, we, we really have, it's almost like today, and I'm glad we do these things. We need, you know, we need how to have a good marriage seminar. You know, we need to have seminars on how to handle your finances. We need to have seminars on how to be successful. But what good are those seminars if the people in your church aren't saved? <laughs> you know, we, 
They've got to come to know Jesus first. Listen, if you got Jesus as the Lord of your life, you'll have a good marriage. Amen. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will become prosperous. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, he will teach you how to manage finances. So, but because we're not really preaching Jesus as Lord and and, you know, I was in a revival in the mid 80s <clears throat> and uh, a lady came up to me. It really shocked me. And she said, she said, you know, uh, you use a word every time you preach that we don't hear very much. And, and it kind of shocked me. And I said, well, what word is that that I'm using so much? Listen, she said, Jesus. Jesus. What are we preaching if we're not preaching Jesus? You ought to go back and listen to some of your recordings and count how many times you say the name of Jesus. I mean, you may listen to your recordings and see that you mentioned a lot about success and prosperity and happiness and joy. Just count how many times you say the name of Jesus. There's still power in the name of Jesus. But you know, we've gotten away from the, the fundamentals. The church has gotten away and we're suffering. Look at us. The churches are dying. Listen, the answer to Kenya is not a certain political party. Mm. The answer to the United States is not a certain political party. Now, that's what the news networks would like for us to believe. Yes. But if we're going to believe the good news and not the fake news, the good news to turn a country around is for his kingdom to come on earth like it is in heaven. <laughs> and that has nothing to do with the political party. It's about Jesus and his kingdom. So I want to read some verses. I did this last time, but I want to get it on recorded. <clears throat> I mean, this is just a very few <clears throat> that I mark in my Bible. That, that ought to prove to us that evangelism is critical in the Bible. Do, do you all agree that it is? Yes. I mean, I hope everybody here agrees that if you read your Bible, evangelism is the heartbeat of what we read. You know, it's, that's why it's good news. <laughs> you know, news is something you haven't heard. Isn't that what news is? That's why it's called news. <laughs> Amen. And so we need to be giving people the good news, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me just read a few of these. I won't have time to read them all because I have a lot of ground I want to cover, but Acts 13, 47. Now, now listen to the words, okay? For this is what the Lord has commanded us. That's pretty simple. This is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles. That you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. <laughs> yeah, that ought to be enough. I really shouldn't have to read another verse. Really, it ought to be, look, the Lord has commanded us to be a light to the Gentiles, to the lost people, and to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That one verse should be enough. But I think when the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the gospel, they knew that we would catch ourselves in the predicament that we're in today. And so he mentioned it several other times. Mark 16, 15, he said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. That's everybody. That's everybody that lives and moves and breathes. All creation. Acts 20, 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, mean, I could preach on that, but I'm not. You know, because we consider our life to be a whole lot more than nothing today. But Paul said, my life is nothing to me. My only aim 
is to become financially successful. <laughs> no. That's the reverse standard version. <laughs> he said, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. And here's the task. My only aim is to testify of the good news of God's grace. Amen. My only aim. Wow. He didn't say my only aim is to grow a mega church. My only aim is to be successful. My only aim is to become known, to become popular, to become powerful. He said, my only aim is to testify the good news of God's grace. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe that is every preacher's only aim. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Listen to this one, Matthew 5, 15 and 16. People don't light a light and put it under a basket. Huh. Instead, they put it on a stand to give light to everybody in the house. Jesus said normal people don't light a light and hide it. Hmm. We don't light a lamp and then hide the lamp. Jesus said that's not normal. People don't do that. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you to the end of the age. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Yes. I'm not ashamed of the good news because it is the power of God that brings salvation. The power of God. The power of God is in the good news. The power of God is in the good news of the grace of Jesus Christ. The power of God is in the good news of the grace of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hear the word of God. If we're not giving people the words of Christ, then they can't be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now, brothers, I remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, we're saved. By this good news. By this good news, we're saved. By this good news, we're saved. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he's anointed me. And you know that Isaiah passage also, the passage Jesus when he went to the synagogue in Luke chapter 4. Uh, Isaiah 12, 4. In that day I will say, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And proclaim that his name is exalted. Isaiah 12, 4. I mean, you know, Matthew 5, 13, you're the salt of the earth. All of these passages deal with evangelism. Uh, Mark 10, 29, Acts 1, 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, that you'll be my witnesses. You know, the purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit is evangelism. There's no way around it. Yes, there's a lot of the other things, the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. But the driving force is to reach the world and establish the kingdom on earth. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, there's so many. You ought to just do it yourself. Just read through your Bible and just mark every place with a different colored marker where, every, where it's mentioned evangelism. <clears throat> and you know the Great Commission. To go therefore into the whole world. You know, Jesus told them uh, at the end of his ministry to go to Jerusalem and wait. He said, I want you to wait. 
because there's a gift I have for you. Because I have to leave you, and I'm going to send you another one, the comforter. And so Jesus ascends into heaven, and they go into Jerusalem, into the upper room. And the day of Pentecost fully comes, and the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. What's the first thing that happened as a result of the power of the Holy Spirit falling on them? 3,000 people get saved. Yes. The first thing was evangelism. The first thing. You know, wouldn't it be awesome if the power of the Holy Spirit fell on a church today and the first thing they did is they went out on the streets and preached Jesus? Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm afraid that wouldn't happen today. I'm afraid we'd do what they did. In Acts 1.11, when Jesus ascended into heaven, do you know what they were doing? You should read it. The angel said, why are you standing here gazing into heaven? I've always loved that verse in the Bible. You know, I mean, Jesus ascends. He's already told them what to do. Go to Jerusalem. You know, if the angel wouldn't have told them, stop gazing into heaven and go do what he told you to do, they may have never gotten to the upper room. Mm. They may have had a seminar right there on the mountain. Stand and gaze into heaven and wait for Jesus to come back. I don't know. But the angel had to say, hey, what are y'all doing? Mm. What, what are y'all, why are you standing here? He's already told you what to do. Why did he want him to go to the upper room? Because he wanted the gospel to spread to Jerusalem. He wanted them to go, to go, not stand and gaze. He wanted them to go. And you know, it's interesting. A great persecution broke out in Jerusalem. Do you know why? Because they weren't going to obey the great commission of go therefore into all the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. They got comfortable. Listen to me. They got comfortable in Jerusalem. They got comfortable at home. Hmm. They got comfortable being right there in their home church. I mean, it was so, and they were just remembering being with Jesus. And they probably sat around and just would talk about, oh, remember when he did this miracle? And do you remember that time we went to that funeral and rose that, wow, do y'all remember? And they probably had nice little home groups all over Jerusalem about, oh, how wonderful it was. Oh, yes. And they weren't thinking about going. Mm. They got focused at gazing. They were gazing into heaven instead of going to the ends of the earth. So you know what Jesus did? He said, well, I'll fix this. I'm going to send a great persecution. And this persecution is going to force you to leave your comfort zone. <laughs> and now you're going to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. If he wouldn't have done that, the Gentiles wouldn't have got the gospel. Hmm. You know, sometimes God has to push, it out, push us out of the boat, push us out of the comfort of the nest. And sometimes God sends things into our life. And you know what we do? This is what we do. We shout at it and command it to go. <laughs> yeah, we rebuke it. God creates a situation in our life to force us to do what he's called us to do. And then we call it a work of the devil. <laughs> because I'm sure some of them are saying look what Rome is doing to us some of us have lost our life because of these Romans this persecution against God's how dare them attack God's church and I could see them facing the north and facing the south and 
face in the east and face in the west and rebuking these territorial demons and rebuking the spirits that are causing this persecution. And the whole time God was behind it. I, I don't know. I just think God's called us to do something. Amen. God's called us. Listen, and I'm totally convinced of this. The world is in a mess because the church has disobeyed. Yes. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their, their land. land. The only reason our land hasn't been healed is God's people haven't been doing what he's called us to do. We are called to usher the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven. But we're too busy. You know, we're busy doing a lot of good things, but we're not busy doing the things that God's called us to do. We're just busy. But God said, go. That's a verb. It's action. It's a call to do something. And he said, go and make disciples. And I told you this before. Disciples don't make themselves. Mm -hmm. It's an effort. I mean, if you're going to make disciples, it's work. I, I was in a revival one day, and <clears throat> I was preaching on evangelism. And, I, and there was on the front row, there was some people from, a, it was a bunch of kids that were mentally slow. You know what I'm saying? They were kind of mentally slow. And I was preaching, and I, and I said in my sermon, do you know how to spell evangelism? W-O-R-K. And that little boy on the front row stood up and he said, uh-uh, that's the work. <laughs> but let me tell you how you spell evangelism. W-O-R-K. And that's why a lot of churches aren't doing it. Do you know, uh, I don't, I'm not much of a fisherman. But even if you love to fish, it still works. You know, you can't catch fish sitting in your chair in the living room. <laughs> if you're going to catch fish, you got to get your equipment. You got to go to a location. You've got to have bait. You have to, listen, it takes an effort. You don't just sit on the bank. You got to put the line in the water. <laughs> yeah. And True evangelism takes work. And he said, make disciples. Now, I want you to, why do we need to make disciples? So that they can be prosperous, right? Be successful. Live a good life. Be happy. H-A-P-P-Y. Happy. <laughs> I mean, we should teach people how to be happy. You know, how to live a life where there's no conflict. Kind of like the Apostle Paul, you know, he had a conflict-free life. He was only beaten with a cat of nine tails five times, led over a wall in a basket, excommunicated from the church, beaten. <laughs> he didn't have a conflict-free life. Mm. But we want to preach how to have a smooth life and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> You know what made Paul happy? People being saved. Why do we make disciples? What's the purpose of disciples? So that they can be a part of ushering the kingdom of God on earth. Mm. We make disciples so that they can go out and make disciples so they can go out and make disciples. So if I have a disciple, I've got to teach them how to fish for men. Jesus taught his disciples to be fishers of men. I want to do the same, teach them to fish for men. Jesus sent his disciples out. Are you sending your disciples out? Hmm. Or are you calling them in? <laughs> See, we call them in. Come to church, come to church. Jesus said, leave the church. Go to Samaria. 
go out into the desert. There's a guy in a chariot from Ethiopia. Go in the desert and tell him about Jesus. Give the good news. Mm -hmm. Jesus sent him out. We're calling him in. And then we, then we meet together and we go, I don't know why the church isn't growing. <laughs> I, you know, I just don't know why. We, we haven't seen a lot of people saved in the past few months. It's because it's work. And we're not doing what he's called us to do. And, you know, Jesus said, lo, I'll be with you always. That's the key to evangelism is witness. He is with us. He's with us. And the power of witness makes you a witness. Amen. The power of witness will make you a witness. Jesus said, all authority and power has been given to me. Listen, I'm not, I don't want to go somewhere unless I'm with Jesus because he has the authority and the power. I want to go in his authority and power. Amen. And he said, go and baptize them. And, and I kind of mentioned this, and I don't want to get into it because I got a lot of other good stuff I want to share. But, <clears throat> you know, the church, and God forgive me if I'm wrong on this, okay? But we're always straining at gnats and swallowing camels. <laughs> you know, the church is like, major arguments, major divisions in the church over how to baptize people. Entire denomination. Should we baptize in the name of Jesus? Or should we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Or should we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and the name of Jesus? That way we get it all in there. <laughs> And that's what's been made an issue. It's kind of like people say on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've heard it preached every way. You will not be baptized in the Holy Spirit until first you study what it's about. And after you know what it is, you can ask him to baptize you. Some people have said the baptism of the Holy Spirit will come once you're sanctified. Or some people say you can get baptized in the Holy Spirit as soon as you get saved. Some people say you get baptized in the Holy Spirit a week or so after you get saved. Some people say you have to mature some before you get baptized. And so we're all talking about when, when God doesn't care when, he just cares that you do. Amen. But you see what we get hung up on? When? At what point? What do you have to do? When is it supposed to happen? Jesus said, y'all missed, look. I told you I want to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and now y'all are making it all these other issues. We've done the same with baptism. And to be baptized in the name of Jesus, you know, in the name of Jesus means more than repeating the name. You really need to get this and study it yourself. Don't take my word for it. In the name of Jesus means more than saying as a matter of, have you ever asked for something in the name of Jesus and didn't get it? Mm -hmm. But the Bible says, whatsoever mm. you ask in my name, it'll be given to you. But yet we've all asked for things in Jesus' name. In other words, at the end of the prayer, in Jesus' name, amen, right? And so if you end every prayer with, in Jesus' name, amen, You'll get it. It's like a little magic wand. All you have to do is end every prayer in Jesus' name, amen. When I first got saved, I used to hear that. I didn't know what they were doing. I thought it was kind of like Roger over and out. <laughs> you know, I thought that was the only way to say goodbye to God in a prayer time. You know, the only way to hang the phone up was to end it with in Jesus' name, amen. And so for a long time, for years, I would, I would come to the end of my prayer time and I'd go, okay, now, uh, Roger, over and out. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I had to study it, what it meant. It doesn't mean to say the words, to baptize in Jesus' name, to baptize in the name of Father, Holy, and Holy Spirit, to baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Jesus' name. In Jesus' name means you are identifying with him and his kingdom. 
it really doesn't have a lot to do with the words. It's identification. You know, when I was a, a drug addict <laughs> and a drug dealer in the United States, and the police would knock on my door <laughs> and we'd have guns. So, you know, we weren't afraid of, of being robbed because we had a lot of drugs. And they'd knock on my door and I'd look through this little hole in the door and I'd see a little tiny policeman. <laughs> and he would be saying, knock, knock, knock. In the name of the law, open the door. What was he saying? That those words in the name of the law, those six words should make me open the door. <laughs> six yeah. words. It's like a magic wand. As long as the policeman would say, in the name of the law, I had to open the door. But I didn't. I didn't <laughs> care about those words. What I did care about was, if I didn't open that door because of those words, he was going to bring the entire Houston Police Department to my door. And if that didn't work, he was going to bring the National Guard, the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy. He was going to bring the FBI, the CIA, Homeland. In other words, he was saying, if you don't open this door by the authority of who I represent, we're going to take your door down. Mm. That's what in Jesus' name means. It doesn't mean Roger over and out. <laughs> it doesn't mean, listen, what if we're supposed to baptize people in Jesus' name? Suppose. Suppose that's what Jesus meant. We have to say those magic words. In Jesus' name, I baptize you. Suppose. What if somebody got it wrong? They gave their life to Jesus and they baptized him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that person going to go to hell? No. No. Because it's not about the words. Mm. It's about the identification. Amen. But, you know, that's humanity. We get hung up on these little things. You know, the church gets hung up on, you're not supposed to dress this way. You're supposed to dress that way. Mm -hmm. A prophet's supposed to have their head covered. A man's not supposed mm -hmm. to have long hair. You're not supposed to eat this. You are supposed to eat that. You can't go here, but you can go there. You can run with this person, but don't run with that person. That's the church. True. We've gotten hung up on all these little petty things. <clears throat> so anyway, the Great Commission. To go. To make disciples. And, and I told you about a Sunday school teacher by the name of Kimball. Yes. He won a man by the name of D.L. Moody, a great. Now, Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. I believe he was a shoe salesman. He won D.L. Moody to Jesus, a great evangelist. D.L. Moody won F.B. Myers, another great preacher. F.B. Myers wins a man by the name of Mordecai Ham, another preacher. Mordecai Ham wins Billy Graham. You see, we got to see the importance of what we're doing. Amen. A guy by the name of Jerry Burke reached out and witnessed to me for over a year and didn't give up on me. You know, he's not seen probably not, not even seen two, 300 people come get saved in his ministry. But because he reached out to me, he's seen 136,000 people come to Christ. Amen. Jerry reached to me, and there are pastors and people in the ministry all over the world because of our ministry. So what we do is important. What if Jerry wouldn't have stayed with me? Things would be different today. And so in Acts, if you'll study the book of Acts, you'll see evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of times <clears throat> I hear people say this. You know, in Acts, 
chapter four. Let me read it to you. Acts chapter four. You'll turn there. You really ought to see this. Acts chapter four. Here it is. Peter and John were in jail. <laughs> you know, they got thrown in jail a lot <laughs> for, for preaching, you know. And they'd be in jail, they'd be singing and praising God. I don't think we would, would we? No. <laughs> so, you know, what are you saying? I'm going to sue this city. I'm going to get me a law firm. <laughs> So they were in jail and the believers were praying in verse 28 uh, and 29. Now the Lord considered their threats and they enabled your servants to speak your word with great boldness, to stretch out your hands, to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Boldly. Amen. When they prayed, the place was shaken. And, and listen, listen to me. I, I hear people, they go, we're praying until God shakes this place. We want the place to be shaken by the power of God. We want to be like Elijah and call down fire from heaven and see this glorious miracle of fire come down from heaven. That's awesome. It ain't gonna happen. You got all the power you need where you are right now in the church. These people were out there doing evangelism. Elijah was challenging false prophets. He needed the fire. Amen. The place was shaken because they just got out of jail for doing evangelism and told not to preach anymore. And when the place was shaken, they went out boldly. Mm. So, you know, we, we're asking God to shake the place, but we're not willing to do what it takes to move God to shake the place. We want the fire to fall, but we don't want to do what it takes that causes the fire to fall. Listen, we got to get out there. Salt is no good in the shaker. Light is no good under the basket. <laughs> we got to get the salt out of the shaker. We got to get the light from underneath the basket. That's what Jesus thought about it, at least. <clears throat> you know, Jesus' ministry was an outside ministry. Let me read this to you. It's no surprise that Jesus led the church outside. For his own ministry was an outside ministry. Even when he was born, there was no room in the inn. So he was born outside in a stable. He wasn't baptized in the temple, but outside in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. He was outside when heavens opened and a voice thundered forth that said, this is my beloved son in which I'm well pleased. He was outside when he delivered history's greatest sermon on a mountain. He was outside when a woman crawled through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. He was outside when he told the man who had lain beside the pool of Bethesda for 38 years to rise, take up your bed and walk. He was outside when he fed the 5,000 with two fish and five barley loaves. He was outside when he cured blind Bartimaeus. He was outside when he was transformed on the mountain and Moses and Elijah stepped across the barriers of time and came and talked with him. He was outside when he called Lazarus from the grave. He was outside when he calmed the raging storm. He was outside when he cleansed the 10 leopards. When he wanted to teach people about God's care for them, he pointed outside and said, consider the lilies in the field. He was outside of Gethsemane when he found out from his father what was in the cup. He was outside when he made the supreme sacrifice on a cross on Calvary's hill. Remember, Jesus was not crucified on an altar between two candlesticks. 
but outside on Golgotha's hill between two thieves. And early the third day, when he went to look for him on the inside of the tomb, the angels told him, he's not in here. He's outside because he's risen. Amen. And when he got up and ascended back to his father, he led the church out as far as Bethany and stepped on a cloud. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a cloud on the inside. And when he left, the angels told those gathering around that he's coming back again in the same manner that he parted from them outside. So it's obvious Jesus had an outside ministry. Most of what Jesus did was outside. Hallelujah. Now, how we've gotten as backwards as we've gotten today, I don't understand it. But the church and the world is paying a big price. The church is suffering. People are going to hell. People no longer believe in the power of God because the church hasn't displayed it. They've not seen the fire. They've not seen the place shaken. They've not seen the lepers on the outside healed. They've not seen that. So the world... We've become a scam to the world. We're calling people in when Jesus sent people out. And, you know, I, just, I think about, you know, Jesus dying on the cross on the outside. I, 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 I with that. No one bothered me, him dying. I've never liked that part of the good news. <laughs> and he died. The good news is he wasn't going to stay very long. As a matter of fact, they buried him in a, a borrowed tomb. You know, from what I understand, when you borrow something, that means you plan on giving it back. Yes. <laughs> and the Bible clearly says they buried him in a borrowed tomb because Jesus knew he wasn't staying long. He was going to give it back. And three days later, he gave back that borrowed tomb. You know, the good news of Jesus was not just the fact that he came out of heaven. The good news of the gospel is that he came up out of the tomb. Mm. He came out. Not that he dropped out of heaven into Mary's womb. The power of the gospel is he came out of that tomb three days later. And because of that, we're saved and we are where we are today. And then a lot of people listen on evangelism. <clears throat> you know, I know there's a lot of excuses, and I've, I've heard a whole bunch of them, <laughs> and none of them hold water. But we've, we've all made excuses, haven't we, why we don't go do evangelism? Yes. And some of us, you know, we think our excuse is better than the other ones. One of them is, well, we just don't know enough. You know, I've been with people that have been in the church for 20 years, and they go, you know, I'm just not quite ready. <laughs> what, what have you been doing for 20 years? <laughs> Jesus only had the disciples for three years and turned the world upside down. Amen. Upside down. <clears throat> you, know, you know what they said when they, said they called them before the Sanhedrin? He said, look, these are just a bunch of unlearned and ignorant people. They're just ignorant fishermen. They're not educated. We're the rabbis. I mean, we've sat at the feet. We've been taught. We've been discipled. But these people here, they're unlearned and ignorant. However, did been with Jesus. Amen. That makes all the difference in the world. Listen, you hang out with Jesus enough, you'll have a powerful ministry. The key to ministry is witness. Amen. Not in how much you know, there's nothing wrong with knowing a lot and studying a lot, but the power is not in how much you know, it's in how good you know Jesus. Amen. And you know, uh, I think, and I'm running out of time, but I just really want to make this point. And, and I know I'm being pretty straight in this because I, I hope pastors in the United States hear this too. <clears throat> One of the issues, do you remember when you first got saved? 
Yes. Most of the times, the first thing we wanted to do was go tell our families. Mm. We didn't want them to go to hell. You know, we really believed in hell back then. You know, we really believed that if they don't get saved, they're going to go to hell. And I remember talking to my mom and dad, and I, was, I just left a funeral. I looked at my mom and dad. They didn't know Jesus. And I said, Mom and Dad, I know you think I'm crazy because I've given my life to Jesus. And I said, I want you to get saved. I want you to pray this simple prayer. And if you won't do it for yourself, do it for your son. Pray this prayer for me if you won't do it for you so that I'll know when you die. I'll see you in heaven again. So if you won't do it for you, would you at least do it for me? My mom and dad got saved because of that. You know, when we first got saved, we wanted to tell people about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what I believe. Because we were excited. You see, when you get saved, there's a wonder. There's an amazement about Jesus. And I think what's happened because of some of the issues that we see in the church, things that don't look like Jesus, in time, we begin to lose the wonder of Jesus. We just begin to lose the wonder, the amazement how spectacular he was. And we were freshly born again. So we're like, wow, remember what I used to be and now look what I am today. And we've just lost the wonder. I was at a conference <clears throat> and some people took me out to eat and it was a bright day. And we walked from the outside to the inside of this restaurant. You know, when that sun is shining and you go into a dark restaurant, you're kind of blinded. You know what I'm saying? You can't see. And I went from the outside into this restaurant. I couldn't see the menu. It was so dark, I could barely tell where to walk. But the longer I sat in the darkness, the better I began to see. And I wonder today, have we lost the wonder of Jesus? because we've gotten used to the dark. Hmm. Have we gotten used to the dark to where when you first walk out of the light, you can't see anything, but because we've hung around the darkness long enough, we've gotten used to all of that stuff and it's, that's become normal and we need to get back the old normal needs to be the new normal and not get used to the dark. So we need to recapture our excitement and we need to recapture the wonder of Jesus. That's the driving force of evangelism is the wonder of Jesus, that Jesus can say to anybody. We've lost the excitement to see lost people come to Jesus. I, I think we've forgotten that they still go to hell. <laughs> Do you know if they don't get saved, and they die, there's not another chance. Your neighbor, if they die without Christ, will burn in hell forever and ever and ever and ever, never to end. Never to end. And I think we've forgotten that. We've lost that urgency to tell as many people as we can about Jesus. And I, I, that's just. I'm just giving you some reasons why what I've seen over 45 years, why evangelism has dwindled down to almost nothing today. Another reason I think is we've taken evangelism and made it a duty instead of a delight. Mm -hmm. We've made evangelism an obligation instead of a privilege. <laughs> I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ with the ministry of reconciliation. That's a high calling. <laughs> you 
You know, that's, that's awesome that God has called me to give the good news. And I think another reason for leaders is we just get busy. We get busy doing a lot of busyness. <laughs> you know, we really do. Yeah. You know, we think it's important, but, you know, maybe we ought to ask Jesus what he would do that day. I'd like to partner with him because, you know, the great commission is a commission. It's not a mission. It's a commission. It's a mission together with him. So, you know, we ought to ask Jesus, what do you want me to do today? <clears throat> you know, there was a, you know, we talk about, and I said this the other day, and I know y'all are tired of hearing it, but, you know, we've become really good at preaching the gospel, but very poor at sharing the gospel. Ooh. We've polished our preaching, <laughs> but we've not polished our sharing. You know, preachers can get up there and shout with great oratory ability and move the crowd. But are we good at sharing? Hmm. Or are we just working on our preaching? There was a preacher that started the Vineyard denomination in the United States. He was a, used to be involved in drugs. And uh, when he first got saved, he didn't know what they did in church. He'd go to church and the preacher would preach about something. He'd get all excited, and leave, and that was it. He'd go the next Sunday and the preacher would preach on something and he'd get all fired up sitting in the pew and on the way out, he'd look at the pastor and nothing happened. Finally, after one of the sermons, he went up to the pastor. He said, pastor, pastor, man, what a great sermon, but I have a question. When are we going to do the stuff? The next Sunday, the preacher would preach, and this guy would make his way out the front door and grab the pastor and said, Pastor, that was a great message, but I have a question. When are we going to do the stuff? The next Sunday, he did it again. Pastor, when are we going to do the stuff? And the pastor said, what are you talking about? He says, man, you've preached a lot of good stuff, but I don't see anybody doing it. We're good listeners but we're not good doers. <laughs> you know, we got to be doers of the word, not just listeners. You know, it doesn't take faith to listen. <laughs> it takes faith to do. Am I right? Yes. And I'm almost stopped there. I I've got some other points we'll talk about next week. But You know, I, just, I really want you all to, more than anything, I want you to see that we, we've got a calling. Yeah. And we, the church, this is a plea to the church. It's a plea to the church in Africa and in America to come back to evangelism. I mean, we need to become aggressive, militant, intentional. We need to plan. We need to prepare. We need to put as much emphasis every week into outreach as we do worship. I mean, worship teams meet once and twice a week and rehearse it and go over it. Are we putting that much time into evangelism? Here's something to think about. I'm kind of passionate about this subject. I think you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I've been passionate about it for 45 years. Dennis knows that. All the way back to streetwise. I, I've pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed on evangelism. And, and I've been ridiculed and put down and accused of and everything in the world. Not because I was discipling people, but because I got church out of the building mm. people didn't like that you know there used to be a saying elvis presley was a singer back in the day and and they used to say at the end of his concerts elvis has left the building <laughs> that's what they used to say 
Elvis has left the building. I made a Jesus t-shirt that said, the church has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> and it needs to. We, we need, need to get out of the salt shaker yes. and get out there and do what God's called us to do. <clears throat> we'll talk more about it next week. Any questions or comments? Yeah, we, we are so grateful. Um, I really thank, you know, what, what you've been teaching us and Pastor Dennis, it has really saturated us. Like, uh, we've been planning on how to go out. You know, there's a, I remember on, on 14th, Pastor Dennis taught us about getting out the mud, you know? Yes. And uh, <laughs> when, you, when you combine this subject, uh, we get out the mud that is in us and then we go out with with the with the with the with the with the voice of evangelism. Uh, I think it's true. In Kenya, we really need to 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 go out and reach out because uh, people out there they are hungry to hear the word. Yes, they so, are. As as you as you as you've just been saying here, we we as this class we are really at it. This yeah. week we'll be going out. We'll be going uh, to um, we talk talk, and we have a very great plan that we planned at at, at, at Sylvia's church, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a program that we are running to all schools in that area. We are planning yes. it out and laying it out, and we thank God for the Jesus film that came, the new Jesus uh -huh. film that we can yeah. go to school and you know and you know uh, show it. And now we we want to do. We don't want just to go and. Um, and, and just preach and win people to Jesus and then come back. We, we realize that many people go and win people to Jesus and then they leave a lot of babies everywhere. We want yeah. to go there and still go back and, and, and nurture them. Even if, if it's school, we go back there yeah. and, you know, we disciple them, uh, you know, that's, that's the plan that we have. So um, we've realized that uh, that's the most important thing that we should be doing. You know, as, as much as we know that the church will get full and everything will go on, but uh, uh, we've really uh, can, we've come to understand that evangelism is the key point mm -hmm. that we are supposed to be doing, and then the rest will come later. So we, we are really we are really thankful for this. And uh, as we told you last, when we went out the last last time we went out, you know, we went and found we saw sign and wonders that yeah. lady that yeah. wasn't working for three. Yes. I think he lost his internet, but the lady started walking and she's working. Yes. Yes, the one for three the months. the one who was in prison for three months. Yeah, wow. for three months. Wow. And now uh, we, we start believing that when you go outside, you don't see that. But when you go outside there and, and reach out to people that they really they're really hungry to know this word, they believe and We've seen signs and wonders. They are yeah. they're getting healed. Yeah. So it's it's really it's really helpful. And uh, you know we can't wait to go back there. We can't wait you guys to come so that we can go and learn more from you as you usually do. But mm -hmm. as you teach us here, we are ready and we are doing it here. So yes. we, we really Amen. appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, we are truly looking forward. That's why I think last week I said we can't ask any more questions and we've been sharing with Pastor Timothy. And I, I, I was just making a joke with him. I think it was on Monday for the during the recap. And I was like, you know, initially when you began about the evangelism and then you got to a point every week you'd come back and say, you know, um, evangelism. And there is a time you said that now we are wrapping it up. But then when you come back again, you know, again the following week. And I told uh, Reverend and Timothy about two weeks ago is when it really hit me. It was, it was, it's like before, yes, you are teaching it, but it's like I caught an impartation. It's like I caught it at that time. And I was like, thank God, because initially I was like, oh my God, he's back with evangelism. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand that God just really wanted me to catch, yeah. you know, that yeah. impartation. It was not just listening and sitting and listening. And, and no, it was to catch that impartation. Yeah. And I really, really thank God for that. And it's true, like this Sunday, as we go to Oloi Talk Talk, 
on it's he, uh, Reverend Timothy can tell you that some of the schools we reached out during the week, they were like, they want to come into the church and just see the church and, you know, and uh, we were just like excited. And I thank God because the team will be ready. Even if we have gone to Oloi Talk Talk, they will they'll just want to come and now see the church. And so thank you so, so much. Amen. Thank you I'm so much. So. Y'all get to go. And, <clears throat> you know, so y'all have been to Bible school and Y'all have been discipled, mentored. But I would venture to say that your discipleship did not include evangelism. Yes, yes, that's true. And to me, that is deceptive discipleship. Mm -hmm. You need to include in your discipleship program evangelism. Mm. The purpose of discipleship is so that they can go and that the other ones can go and that the other ones will go. And so we have to include evangelism as a part of our discipleship. Yes, you have to teach them to love their wives and you have to teach them. But if we're not teaching them to reach out, we're not teaching true Jesus discipleship. And, and if you'll get the new converts to do this, your church will grow like that. Amen. It really will. You've got to get those new converts activated in true discipleship, which includes evangelism. Amen. But, uh, you know, I, I, and I agree with you, Sylvia. I think it's going to take an impartation. Yeah. It's not going to take knowledge or a class. There needs to be a spiritual impartation of the criticalness of evangelism. Yeah. It needs to be like Jeremiah said, it's fire in my bones. Yes. It needs yes. to burn in our innermost being of yes. what we need to be busy doing. Yes, and that's what I realized. It really needed to be an impartation that even my view of the scripture and how I was interpreting some of the things that I'm so conscious that even when I'm like I'm preparing the word or getting ready for the word, I'm really asking myself, is part of this evangelism and the good news part of what I'm speaking. Yes, yes. You, yeah. and, yeah. and that's what I told Reverend Timothy. That's what came to me. It was like an awakening. Yeah, yes. If I can say of some sort. And for true, it, 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 it's not about the class every other day. And for us, it was just like, you know, the class, the class, until I caught it. Then I was like, ah. Huh, wow, wow. And that's, that's awesome. what happened to me two weeks ago. It was two weeks ago, and I was sharing with Reverend Timothy. Well, I know that, you know, as an evangelist, I was all over the United States preaching and had a street ministry and did inner city ministry in Dallas. And I saw more signs and wonders there than I did in a Sunday school class. Mm. I saw more of the power of God displayed when I put myself in a situation that I needed him. When we were in Il Talel and those Morans wanted to come get us and God knocked every one of them on the ground because they were going to get Michelle and I, you won't see that in a Sunday school class. That's true. You have to put yourself out there. You'll never walk on the water till you get out of the boat. Mm. And a lot of people, you know, they, they, they dream of walking on the water and so they think they've really done it. Yeah. But it's only a dream. It's a fantasy. Mm. They fantasize about walking on water. And the reason why they have to fantasize is they've not gotten out of the boat. You've got to get out of the boat if you want yes. to really experience walking on water. Yes. And the odd and thing most people won't. Yes, and what and what you and and I remember Pastor Dennis also when he taught us about the dimensions of growth. He said we are expecting from people something that we've not taught them. Woo, amen. That's so true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we were sitting and looking at the members and expecting, you know, all these things and sometimes pushing them, you know, when he talks about the three dimensions of growth, but we've not taught them. So exactly what you're saying, then we are there in the church. It's OK, but we, 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 are, we don't know it and we are not teaching it to them. And, and, and the end is he wants sons. Yeah. In fact, Pastor, Pastor Dennis said the intention is for sons. Yes. 
Yeah, sons, yes. And you know, the, uh, you know, we have what's called a fishing guide in the United States. Do you all have those? They're professionals and they take you fishing and they, and they guide you and they take you and you catch a lot of fish because they're a professional fishing guide. Mm -hmm. Pastors should be professional fishing guides. Amen. See, we should be the people saying, let me, you want to get out of the boat? Watch me because I've done it a hundred times. Mm. You can't stand in the boat and preach. Now, let me give you three steps on how to get out of the boat, but I'm going to stand here and preach it to you while you do it. If you're going to teach people how to get out of the boat, you need to get out of the boat and preach it standing on the water. <laughs> anyway, Man. I'm done for the day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, Amen. Dennis, I love you, man. I'm going to have to come see you. We love you, Pastor Dennis. Yeah, we thank God for you, Pastor Dennis. We love you. Thank you. I love you all, too. And your hey. specs look cool. If I you come know? see you, will you take me to lunch? Tell me what day you're coming. All right. I'm going to get you to take me to lunch. Huh? All right. Amen. And say, hey, hi to mom. say hi to mom Jen also. And uh, mom, that was a great, that was a great teaching today. Amen. Thank yeah. you. Dennis. I love you guys. I'll send you the, the copy. Okay. Yes. Love y'all. Thank you. Bye -bye. Pastor, and especially Pastor Don, the page with the Jesus was outside from the bath up to the, oh, yeah. that page. I okay. really love that page. <laughs> I'm giving all of my notes to uh, Timo and it's a stack about that big. So. <laughs> Amen. Know what you want to do with them, but they're going to be yours. <laughs> Amen. We are yes. going to really, you know, use them and go over them and use them and, and put some of those in our sermons. I hope you allow us. Yeah, they're not mine, they're God's. <laughs> yes. I love you, so you all. Have a great evening. Good Thank night. you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye.